Wednesday. Webinar Wednesday. Shaping the way we teach English. Webinar course. Shaping the way we teach English. Webinar Wednesday. and welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English, webinar course 14, brought to you by the American English team. My name is Jennifer Hodgson, also known as Moderator Jenny, and we'd just like to give a big welcome to all the teachers from around the world. Please share with us where you're logging in from. So I think most of you know this by now, but just a few reminders. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. And the way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as you are already doing. And this is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. Your presenters may also ask you questions in the form of polls. And these will be multiple choice questions that will appear on your screen for you to answer. You will see myself, moderator Jenny, and moderator Heather in the chat box to assist you. Some people may have technical problems, and unfortunately, we cannot fix individual technical issues, but we will let you know if we're having a global problem. If you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod that you can see in the bottom of the screen. Webinar courses consist of six webinars. And during the course, they take place every other Wednesday. For participants who attend at least four out of the six webinars, you will receive an e-certificate from your regional English language officer or local U.S. Embassy. Since this is the end of the course, and if you attended at least four webinars, you should receive a certificate within the next few weeks. At the very end of the webinar, we will ask you to submit your attendance by typing your email address into the specific attendance box. Please do not submit it before we request it or it will not be counted. I hope all of you are already familiar with this site, but this is our Ning site, and this is where you can interact with the presenters and ask additional questions after the webinar. And you can also access the recordings, readings, and resources from each webinar as well. If you haven't visited the site, you will need to register first, and then your membership will be approved within two days. This is a great way to also stay in touch with us in between webinar courses as well. But don't worry, even though today is the last webinar of course 14, we are getting ready for Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course 15 that is starting next year in January um, with lots of different great topics to look forward to. So we hope to see you in webinar course 15. And the way to join us is to please register through your regional English language officer or local U.S. Embassy. So even though you are registered for course 14, must still register for course 15. In order to web chat for English language learners. So the webinar is for learners, not teachers. But if you do have some English language learners that might be interested in attending, this webinar will be tomorrow on Thursday at 8 a.m. Washington, D.C. time. And we also have a create your own board game competition. Um, and this is for teachers who want to try to create their own board game and submit it to American English. You will be part of our board game competition and there will be winners. So please check it out on our website. You can find information about both of these at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. And finally, another way to stay in touch with us between now and our next webinar series in January is to like us on Facebook. Uh, we can continue our conversations, and there's also lots of great resources for both teachers and learners of English on this site. So now for today's presentation. 
Our webinar is entitled, Let's Play Ball, Using Cultural Themes to Teach English, brought to you by the American English Team. Using thematic units in the EFL classroom is a great way to attach interesting and relevant content to language learning. To many learners are themes related to the culture and society of English-speaking countries. However, because of English's unique role as the global lingua franca, teachers must remember that skills of awareness and adaptation to unfamiliar context are just as important as factual information. We cannot predict where, when, or with whom our learners will use English. It is entirely possible that they may never use English with native speakers. Still, all language use is related to culture in one way or another, and as, as, as such, Culture must be part of what we teach. To that end, this webinar will demonstrate how teachers can use one theme in American culture and society, baseball, to give learners a toolkit for deciphering and using messages that contain a deep cultural context, no matter their source. Our presenters today are John Mark King and Whitney Mertz. John Mark earned an MA in teaching English to speakers of other languages from American University in 2003 after serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Uzbekistan. He was an English language fellow in Turkmenistan and Russia and also taught English in Bangladesh. Before joining the Foreign Service, he was the director of the English Language Institute at the American University of Mongolia and his interests include non-native English-speaking teachers, English for academic purposes, and intercultural communication. Whitney earned an MS in teaching English to speakers of other languages from Long Island University after teaching ESL in an elementary school in Brooklyn. She was an English language fellow in Yemen and also trained teachers in Kyrgyzstan, Iraq, Mexico, and Guatemala. Before joining the Foreign Service, she was a manager for the English Access Microscholarship Program, and her interests include memoir writing and engaging multiple intelligences in the EFL classroom. So welcome, John, Mark, and Whitney. Good morning, good evening, good night. <laughs> Let's play ball using cultural themes in the English classroom. I'm John Mark King. And I'm Whitney Hurts. John Mark and I are both regional English language officers, or RELOs, currently working in Washington, D.C. And welcome to Webinar Wednesday. <laughs> Our webinar today hopes to address the concept of teaching culture in the EFL classroom. So we have a poll that we would like you to take. We want you to answer this question. Does the teaching of culture have a place in the EFL classroom? Answer honestly, please. Yes or no? Ooh, 100%. Well, maybe that's just one person. It might just be one person. <laughs> so far, I still at 100. That's great. Oh. Somebody. Oh, somebody changed their vote. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Well, you know what? Um, I think that it appears that our webinar friends might agree with us, Whitney. I think they do. Uh-huh. Because I think the answer is yes. You do. <laughs> so if the answer is yes, then I would have to ask, why? But of course, don't worry, there are no wrong answers. We just want to hear what, uh, what you have to say. If most of you said yes, tell us why. We would love to hear why you think it is relevant in the EFL classroom. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> Julia is far away from the USA. Uh -huh. <laughs> Connection to real life. I like that answer. That's good. Daily life. Uh, context is very important. I'm going to the U.S. to understand each other. That's a great answer. 
learning something new. It's all around. That's actually something that will come up later. Community is integrated. That's something that comes up later too. I think I'm going to use that answer myself. <laughs> Okay. So, um, what we're going to do now is uh, go back in time a little bit and um, look at how, in, in the past, uh, people in our profession looked at the teaching of culture. So, why teach it? Well, in the old days, we used to teach what was called target cultural competence. So, what this means is that a teacher has a specific culture in mind that he or she is trying to help the students to adapt better to. So, for example, if I'm an immigrant in the U.S., then my English teacher would help me to better integrate into American culture by giving me very specific skills that I can use in my daily life, like writing a resume or um, asking for directions. However, this may not be enough. It could also be relevant to the webinar participant that said Chile is far from the USA. So he's saying to teach the target culture of the United States in his English classroom. Right. So I understand what you mean, but what exactly is culture? Oh. Well, hmm, that's a good question. Because I know that word, and you know that word, Whitney. I and I bet you all of our webinar friends know the word. But just because we agree that we know it, maybe we don't agree on the definition. So webinar friends, what is culture? Tell us your opinion. What is culture? To you know one another? Culture is life. Mm -hmm. That's deep. <laughs> Identity, customs, uh -huh. lifestyle, <laughs> history. Uh, tradition, that's a very common answer we see a lot. Music. Uh huh. Beliefs, language, traditions again, slang. That's an interesting slang answer. Slang is an interesting one. Yeah, we're getting lots of different answers, huh? Definitely. Yeah, interesting. So, let's look at some of these things you've said. You've said things like art. Yeah, did art come up? It should have because I art. someone said art. Yeah. 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 Holidays. Mm -hmm. I like, oh, and Thanksgiving is actually coming up, isn't it? It's very soon, mm -hmm. next week. Mm -hmm. Oh, clothing. Did anybody say clothing? Yes. Yeah. It's I saw costumes. Yeah, that's pretty close. Music. Yeah, music was definitely mentioned. International music, music from different parts of the world is really fascinating, huh? Definitely. Every time I travel, I love to find local music. Food. I also. Mm -hmm. Oh, sports. Did anybody say sports? I don't know if any of our I'm not sure. It's all sports. Yeah, but um, and uh, sports actually happens to be our topic. It does. Doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. We're looking at baseball, I mean, in a larger cultural context, but we are going to start looking at baseball. So these are traditional views of what culture is, um, but we have a possible different definition. Uh, which integrates this into a deeper meaning, which is culture is values and beliefs that help us to identify ourselves and understand others. Yeah, and remember, this is just a possible definition. You may have another way of describing it. I think the fact that people look at culture differently and define it differently is part of the main point, that it's hard to get a hold on. Um, it's not something that is static or unchanging. Um, and this is a, just the beginning of understanding culture. One of the, the key points that we want to get across in this webinar is that uh, culture is made up of many, many things that are not visible or not readily obvious. And I actually want to try an analogy. Whitney, will you help me with this analogy? Yeah. Okay. Whitney, I'm a fish. You're a fish. I am a fish. Okay. Now, please, I have a question for you. As a fish, can you tell me, Whitney, what is water? Okay, Mr. Fish, I think I'm going to need some help from my webinar friends. Um, water is uh, where you live. What does that mean, where I live? I don't understand. It's uh, what you breathe. I don't, what, I, what, I don't see anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I just breathe. I, I swim in water. Have you ever seen me swimming? 
to swim in water, but when swimming is just what we do. It's just like how I move. How does that explain water to me? Okay, John Mark. <laughs> Why don't you tell me how to explain water to a fish? Okay, so here's what you do. If you want to describe water to a fish, you reach into the water, you pull the fish out of the water, and you say, hey, fish, look, that's water. Ah. Culture is kind of the same way. It is everywhere. We live it, we breathe it, it affects all of our actions and all of our decisions in ways that we don't notice. And in order to see it from the outside, you have to kind of step outside of it and look at it from a different angle. So water to a fish is like culture to us. Excellent, yes. Ah, I <laughs> understand. So here's another analogy of uh, culture, and many of you might be quite familiar with this. It, it isn't, and you can see that the part of the iceberg that we see above the water is pretty small compared to the part of the iceberg that we don't see, which is under the water. And culture is kind of like this. So if we take an example like clothing, we saw clothing in one of the pictures, and many of the participants mentioned clothing. Uh, clothing is what we see. Clothing is above the water. But what's happening underneath is a lot of values and a lot of assumptions about uh, you know, why that clothing is important that is not visible, especially to an outside observer. So there might be things about a person, like a country's history or a society or roles of specific individuals like men versus women that inform the clothing, but we can't really see it. So that, that is one way, uh, or another way of looking at it, and then there's um, this other way that we would like to show you, um, and, there's that, a poll. and there's a poll. That's right, so please take the poll and answer very quickly. In this picture, what do you see first, an old woman or a young woman? Answer right away. What do you see when you look at that, John Mark? I always see a young woman. And you see Whitney? I always see the old woman. Uh, and I have to kind of force my brain to, to, to change in order to see the old woman. Hmm. Every time. Hmm. There's definitely a split. More people are seeing the young woman first. No, come on. Agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, interesting, interesting. Okay. Well, so this is another way of looking at culture. Whereas instead of it being visible or under the water, we see it. It's there, but we may not know what we're looking at, or we may have to train ourselves to look at it differently, just like in this optical illusion. So you're saying that we see it differently and that we are coming at the image from our own place, but it's really difficult to not misinterpret what we see when we're looking at culture because we might lack the background knowledge. Um, I can definitely remember situations when I was misinterpreting a cultural symbol. Um, when I was traveling, there were definitely miscommunications between myself and people in the other cultures. Have you ever had something like that, John Mark? I have, actually. And so this is kind of like, so uh, the example would be that this is a situation where I see a young woman and the other person sees an older woman. And we don't know that we disagree. So. Uh, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Uzbekistan, one day I was at the bank and I was standing in line and there was another American in line also and someone else in the line, a, a local gentleman, uh, I noticed was actually staring at the other American and I got, I got angry. Now, why did I get angry? Well, because in American culture, staring is rude. It's very rude. It is. It can mean a lot of things that aren't very nice. Yeah. And I immediately applied my own background knowledge to the current situation, but obviously the person who was staring wasn't trying to be rude. In fact, in Uzbek culture, it's not rude to stare. And so I was quite embarrassed by that. But you really didn't have a choice but to try and interpret what you were seeing from your own background knowledge. That's normal. Precisely. So um, how, if we understand this concept, how can that help us in our classrooms as teachers? Another great question. Thank you. <laughs> but we have a responsibility because we don't know, we can't predict where with or with whom our students are going to be using English. Maybe native speakers, but where would the native speakers be from? Just because someone is an American doesn't 
uh, everything about them and what they're going to say. They may likely never communicate with native speakers at all. So um, we want to help them to become better intercultural communicators. That's the whole idea. Because the world of English is made up of many, many different cultures. Everywhere I have traveled to every corner of the earth, I have always come across an English speaker. How about you, John Mark? Everywhere. everywhere. In fact, um, yes, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so one way we can help our learners to be better at um, incorporating this idea is by teaching them critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. which are a set of skills that our students can use to go beyond what they see and raise their awareness of the differences between people. So they see what's happening, they see the, the clothes they're wearing, they see someone staring, they see these things, but we need to raise their awareness to understand that they might be interpreting that, that situation incorrectly. So it starts with integrating questions into the learning process as teachers and allowing our students to begin to not only gather information, but to assess it. As teachers, we definitely have students in our classrooms that just want to gather the information to pass the test. They just want to learn the grammar point. But we need to get them to start critically thinking about the traditional ways of grammar, vocabulary, etc., and begin to assess them their, themselves because it's a transferable skill that can benefit all parts of their life. Exactly, and it's a lot of fun in the classroom too. Um, and and the, when we move our students from gathering information to assessing information and finally evaluating it um, is key, absolutely key. It's key, we have to be leaders in the classroom to lead them through this process. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Right. Um, I have something here that we can use in our classroom. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, we have some photos. Okay, I can't wait to see them. And they have, we're going to ask our webinar participants um, to look at something that we all do that might have different meanings for everyone. For example, smiling. Oh, why do people smile? Why do people why smile? Why do people smile? That's a really good question. Why do people question. smile? That's right. Why do people smile? Exactly. Right. Um, and so maybe we can ask our webinar friends to answer very quickly. They're happy. Happy, Show yeah. emotion. Right, right. Yes. Friendly. Nervous. Nervous. Ah, interesting. Something is funny, obviously. Excited. Shy. Excellent. Hmm. So what you're showing us is that there are many, many reasons why people smile. So if you see someone smiling, you shouldn't assume you know why they're smiling. So okay, good. Let's look at some uh, photos. We're going to show you a photo of someone smiling. Okay, webinar friends, why is this person smiling? Take a guess. Do your best. <laughs> She's really happy. She met someone she likes. She's posing. <laughs> <laughs> right, because she's being photographed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's friendly. Uh -huh. Joyful, that's a good answer. She yeah. likes smiling. I like that one. I, I smile because I like smiling. It feels good. <laughs> That's a good reason. Uh, so, uh, Whitney, why do you think she's smiling? Um, well, I think she's been playing in the water. Mm -hmm. I'm going to assume she's with her friends and she's having fun, so she's laughing. Mm, good. I think she's smiling because that's some good news. She's very okay. really happy about it. Potentially. Mm -hmm. All right, let's look at another photo. Uh huh. So why do you think she's smiling? Yeah, webinar friends, tell us why is she smiling? Flirting. Got that a lot this morning. We sure did. Joking. Looking at someone she likes. Talking with a young man. When I first saw this photo, I thought maybe she was embarrassed at. Uh, the photographer taking a photo of her, mm -hmm. so she looked away. When I first saw it, I thought that she had a secret. Mm. Yes. Interesting. So, from these slides, you, we saw the importance of being aware that the lack of background knowledge affects how we communicate with people who are different from us. So, just like you had to do with these pictures, you, did, you had no context at all 
but you had to guess, okay, why is this person smiling? This is difficult because we don't always share background knowledge with people and this leads to miscommunication. And simply being aware of this is one very important piece of being a successful intercultural communicator. So in our classrooms, we want to look at ways to build awareness. And we have some ideas, don't we? Yes, I have a great way to build cultural awareness in your classroom. A board game. I love board games. Me too. In honor of Create Your Own Board Game Month on AmericanEnglish.state.gov, we created a board game that you can use in your classroom with your students to help them begin to look at what is behind some of these cultural symbols that we've talked about. Because we want them to not only see the symbol, but to look and see what these words mean to them. And it's going to allow them to practice their critical thinking skills. And the students will take turns describing what each word means. And for example, we have teachers, holidays, USA, and the students will engage in discussions about different ways in which they view the same thing. So Excellent. when I think of friends, I am probably thinking of something different than you, John Mark. That's right, even though we're both Americans. And I think this is very important for, um, for the classroom. Even if you have, you don't have a multicultural classroom as tradi uh, traditionally defined, people from different countries, for example, everyone is different from everyone else. And people from different parts of town, different parts of the same country, they have the same kinds of differences that people do, who, people do who are from different parts of the world. It's just the greater the distance, the more the difference of the background knowledge. But that doesn't mean that in the classroom, people from the same neighborhood, that they don't. They definitely have these differences and you can explore it. Great, so uh, after the webinar, this board game is gonna be available to you, but I would also encourage you to create your own board game mm -hmm. or create your own board game month. Okay, so let's revisit the uh, tra these uh, original traditional images of culture, like that we already looked at, art and food and music and holidays and traditional costumes. Who's making me hungry? And sports. So these images, we can easily describe them, but remember the iceberg, that there are many things that we can't see in these photos. and. We could simply teach our students the vocabulary or the facts, but we also want to try to get them to look deeper and to teach them usable and relevant cultural skills because they might misinterpret those images without the proper background knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's also just a lot of fun, isn't it? To look under the surface, huh? It is. So we're gonna show you a picture now, a, a new picture. And what I want you to do is to write your immediate reaction. It, 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 I have to warn you, the picture is kind of shocking. Super shocking. Right, right. But this is just an exercise. So uh, when you see the picture in the chat, just write your immediate reaction. And then we'll see what people say. Okay, are we ready? Right. Ready for All the right. picture? Make sure you're sitting down. Make sure you're sitting down. Oh, oh my goodness. All right, what is your reaction, webinar friends? Scary. Scary. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> who's scared for the baby and who's scared for the snake? I know that poor snake. That poor snake. <laughs> <laughs> what if we have your wow, scared, dangerous. Where's his mother? <laughs> Maybe his mother's taking the picture. <laughs> Bizarre friendship. That's a good one. Yeah, okay, so this is an example, friends of uh, jumping right to judgment. You see something that's maybe unfamiliar, a little bit different, you're not used to it, and you have an immediate, oftentimes emotional reaction. And what we want our students to do is to be able to uh, avoid that and maybe take a look at what they see, make sure they understand what they're seeing before they judge it. But it's difficult. It takes practice. Hmm. Practice, huh? Yes. So, here is a simple activity that you can use in the classroom. It's called Describe, Interpret, Evaluate. And you know that they fully understand what it is they're seeing, what it is they're experiencing before they judge it. Right, so with the snake photo we just looked at, instead of jumping to, oh my goodness, that's so scary, jumping to the evaluate, 
you would ask your students to simply describe it and then see what they think is happening and then ask them for their overall reaction or their evaluation. That's right. And so in the first step, you ask them just to tell you what they see. And this is very basic. Objects, people, colors, they shouldn't guess what's happening. Just tell you exactly what they can definitely see. After that stage, you ask them to interpret. And this is where they can begin to guess. What do you think is happening in the picture? And after that, finally, they're able to make an evaluation. And for our purposes in this culture lesson, we've written evaluate as what cultural values do you think are expressed in this activity? So, the Blooms? I do. The Blooms taxonomy is a lot of fun, isn't it? Describe, interpret, and evaluate is closely related to Blooms taxonomy. It's a simplified version, essentially the same thing, where at the beginning stage, you're looking at basic remembering of facts and understanding things, where at the end stage, you're being creative, you're evaluating, you're analyzing, you're basically judging. And um, I think that it's important to remember that these steps go in sequence. You don't want to jump to interpret or jump to evaluate before you have gone through the earlier stage, because the success at one level or one stage depends on what you did in the previous stage. We should practice. Practice is good. Practice Absolutely. makes perfect. It does indeed. So, um, we're going to do describe, interpret, evaluate. You, our webinar friends are going to do it. All right? And we're going to do it first. Oh, that's right. We're going to show them a picture, and you and I are going to demonstrate it. Yes. Then they're going to do it. Okay, so are we ready? Yes. All right. Okay, so we're going to de demonstrate this process for you now. All right, John Mark. Wow. What do you see? Remember, only describe exactly only describe. what you see. Okay, I'm only going to describe. I see a stadium, and I see grass, I see dirt, um, I see many, many people. I see people in the stands, and I see people on the, the, on, on the field, um, and I see buildings, and what look like advertisements and a giant television. Good. That was a very good description. Thank you. Thank well you. done. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to ask you to interpret. What do you think is happening? Well, I think that they are, they are playing a baseball game. People are watching a baseball game. Very good. Mm -hmm. What else? Well, I can actually see what is happening right now because I can see that somebody just hit the ball and they are running from home plate to first base. And all the other players are looking out at left field where way, way in the distance by the MasterCard sign you can see the baseball. There it is. Oh, great. <laughs> There's an arrow. Excellent. Okay. Very good. So now we're going to move into the evaluate. Mm -hmm. So, John Mark, uh -huh. what cultural values do you think are expressed in this activity? Okay. Well, this is a hard question. But fortunately, I'm ready for it. All right. Uh, when I see this picture, I think about the uh, a lot of different American values, but one that comes to mind first is the value of social mobility or access. So what I mean is that Americans like to think that anybody who works hard can succeed. And so it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, uh, if, you, if you want to be a successful baseball player, you can do it, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think about maybe some famous players like like the uh, famous New York Yankees catcher, Yogi Berra. Yogi Berra. Right, and I think about Yogi Berra because he symbolizes a lot about American culture that we really value. I think that, you know, he uh, was not very highly educated. He was not really very athletic, but he was a really great baseball player. And also, he was a, a nice person. He was friendly, he was kind, he gave to charities, and these are values that Americans really hold. Excellent. Well done. So, you mentioned a couple of cultural values just now during your evaluate, um, and since that might be the most difficult part for our students, let's look at some other American values communicated through baseball. Excellent. So, uh -huh. triumph of the underdog. John, what is an underdog? Well, an underdog, Whitney, is somebody 
who should not succeed. No one thinks they're going to succeed. And triumph means success. Ah. Right? So this is when somebody who shouldn't succeed actually does. And this one picture is, is an example of the triumph of the underdog. Who is he? His name is Jim Abbott, and he was a professional baseball player, and he had only one hand. Whoa. That's right. He was a professional baseball player with only one hand? That's right. So he threw left-handed, and he would keep his glove on his other arm, and as soon as he threw the ball, he would switch the glove to his left hand so he could catch it. That is amazing, and that is certainly triumph of the underdog. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Hard work. Well, hard work is definitely an American value. I think what makes it uniquely American because people work hard all over the world. Of course. So what Americans think about hard work is that it is its own value. So hard work is its own reward, meaning it doesn't matter if you're really successful. If you work hard, the activity was very valuable. Self-reliance. Self-reliance. Well, let's see. Self-reliance means you depend on yourself. And in baseball, even though you're on a team, you have to have you have a very specific job, and you're standing out there all by yourself, and you have to do well on your own. Uh huh. So it doesn't matter uh, if your team loses; if you perform well, that's good. That's right. In baseball, individual statistics are oftentimes more important than the team's win-loss record. Interesting. Sport weight. What? That's not sportsman. Oh. Oh my goodness, that is very unsportsmanlike. That is <laughs> very unsportsmanlike. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's better. That is better. When you win sportsmanship. So, sportsmanship is when no matter who wins or loses, at the end of the game, everyone comes together in respect and they're really friendly to each other. That's one of my favorite things about baseball. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't want to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you don't want to be friendly, but you do it because you want to be a good sportsman. All right. Uh-huh, universal sports theme. All right, so this is where you can really use sports in the classroom because there are a handful of themes that we have identified that are present in almost every sport. And you look at them in one sport, you look at them in another sport, and you can actually compare cultural values. Interesting. Yeah. So, for example, a rite of passage. Have you heard this before? I've so, heard of it. Right, so a rite of passage, this is when somebody has to go through a very difficult process to find success. Mm -hmm. And all sports have them. They do. Oh. All sports definitely have uniforms. They do. And unique, they usually have a specific purpose. That's right, and for baseball you have a home uniform, you have an away uniform. Oh my goodness. And then you have a third uniform that you use on special occasions like holidays. Huh. Oh, rituals and superstition. Oh, you told me one time something weird about baseball players being superstitious that if they're winning, they don't wash their underwear. That's right. So if a baseball player is doing really well, something that they'll do is find some kind of ritual or superstition that they'll, they'll keep doing so that they keep being successful. And one very famous example is not washing your underwear. That is disgusting. It is pretty disgusting. But other things like going through a certain set of motions when you're getting ready, or stopping, you know, shaving, which you know can get. It's a summer game, so it can get hot. No, I've seen a lot of players these days with big, big beards. That's right. That's because they're superstitious. Oh, spectators. Well, watching the sport is certainly important, and I think depending on where you are and where you're from or what sport you're watching, it's a very different experience to be a spectator. Yes, in uh, in America, the spectators for baseball or soccer, for example, can get really, really loud, mm -hmm. um, but everyone is mixed. Most team fans come together, but in some soccer stadiums in Europe, the different uh, fans have to be separated because they get really angry with each other. <laughs> do they? They do. Oh my goodness. Um, also, competition and skill. I think in every sport, that's a big part of it, being competitive. I know that Americans are pretty competitive. Definitely. Practice. Yeah. There it is again. Practice makes perfect. That's right. <laughs> I mean, you need to practice English to learn it, right? Mm -hmm. But if you want to be a good ball player, you also have to practice. Famous players. I think every sport has famous players. I bet no matter what sport you, our webinar participants have in their country, that they know famous players that came from that sport. That's right. And I bet if you ask any American who is the most famous baseball player, 
they would say what, Whitney? Babe Ruth. That's right, Babe Ruth, definitely. Rules and judges, all sports have rules, all sports have judges. And I think the way that we choose to observe the rules or the rules that we assign to judges is reflective of our culture. Excellent. Physical prowess, being strong, being able to compete, always very important in just about every sport. Mm -hmm. Except maybe golf. <laughs> maybe golf. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Songs and dancing. Ah, wow. I bet everyone has songs that they sing when they go to their favorite sports match in their country. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite song, John Mark, from baseball? Winnie, I know what you're thinking. I think we should sing it. We should sing the song? Yes. Maybe um, right now. Right now. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I never get back We're rooting for the home team They we don't win, win, it's a shame Cause it's one, two, three strikes You're out at the old ball game Oh, that's a good thing I sing that song and I can almost picture myself on a hot summer day With oh. a bag of popcorn in my hand yes. And a Coca-Cola in my other hand Watching the ball game Did you just give an advertisement to Coca-Cola? No so, and earlier you gave an action. <laughs> so, just now in that song, we said one, two, three strikes, you're out. And that was one of our free webinar polls. That's right. So the answer is three strikes and you're out. Now, what is a strike? We don't have time to explain because it would take three hours. We do not. <laughs> so here's one more universal sports theme, which is tradition and history, which that song is very much linked to. That's right. So we have since about, uh, since when, gosh, over 100 years, at one point in the game, in the, every baseball game in America, in the middle of the seventh inning, we stand up and we sing that song. Everywhere. Yep. That's right. Every game. We always do it. I've never been to a ball game where we didn't do it. So, how about some other sports? Oh. We want our webinar participants. So, John Mark and I modeled the Describe, Interpret, Evaluate with baseball, but now we want to do the same with you all in some other sports. So we're going to show you a picture, and we're going to ask, fill out, uh, or describe, interpret, and evaluate. And before we do it, we want to remind you that first we're going to describe. Don't interpret or evaluate. Only describe. Only use exactly what you see. Don't Talk about what you think is happening. All right. Here we go. So you should see three boxes eventually. What we want you to do is write only in the first box. Describe. What do you see? In the describe box, tell us what you see. And be careful not to interpret here. Good. Grass, men. Mm -hmm. Two guys. Oh, somebody guessed Mongolian. Interesting. Ulema. Blue underpants. True. Blue underwear. Oh, they're doing very, very good. Judges. Only right in the first box. Wow. These are really good answers. And I, I can see they're trying really hard not to, to interpret. It's very good. So, announce a unique hat. Great. All right, thanks guys. Now, go to the second box. Tell us what you think is happening. What do you think is happening in this picture? Fighting a sport, they're fighting wrestling. They're having a match, competition. Musumo. Part of a ritual. A game is in progress. Fantastic. Oh, there's a judge. That person in the back maybe is a judge. Wrestling, training, competitive conquest. Wow. That's wow. A, that, that's a great phrase. Okay, so now this is the hard question. So don't worry. Do your best. Guess. What is the cultural significance or what cultural values do you think are transmitted in this activity? String. Uh-huh. So put your answers in the third box. Tradition, power, heritage. Status. Uh, 
kinds of answers that I gave for baseball. Mm -hmm. Power. Rite of passage. Maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah, very good. Very good. Somebody's paying attention. Someone listening. <laughs> That's great. Okay. I actually, Whitney, I did an interview with somebody who knows this sport. What is this sport? This sport is Mongolian wrestling. Ah. Yes, and I used to live in Mongolia. So I got to see the sport performed quite a lot. Yeah. And I found somebody who was from Mongolia, and this person very kindly agreed to allow me to interview her. And we have a recording of her answer to question number three. So we're going to hear how she evaluate what cultural values she sees in this photo. Yeah, would you like to hear it with me? Definitely. All right, let's hear it. What cultural values do you think activity? What cultural values do you think are expressed in this activity? Um, Mongolian national independence, mm -hmm. um, holiday, um, relaxation, people get together, watch uh, wrestling match matches, um, singing songs, lots, enjoy lots of food, mm -hmm. horse racing, mm. um, yes. Yeah? What about the activity itself, wrestling? Is there any cultural value in that activity? Um, what does it mean? Well, it means keeping the tradition um, alive so that we it symbolizes the national independence where the men are very strong and it, the the way they wrestle is the traditional keep the traditional way of uh, keeping the game um, alive so that we would know um, it's it only belongs to Mongolia Wow how about that huh that was kind of interesting very interesting so um i think we should ask oh yes go ahead yeah i was just gonna say we should ask our uh webinar friends to raise their hand mm -hmm. if they saw any um differences between the way the mongolian evaluated the photo and the way they evaluated the photo so raise your hand if you saw a difference wow yep people are raising their hand right you're seeing that she had a lot of background knowledge. That's right, because it's her sport. Because it's her sport. Mm -hmm. So, another picture. Well, in the classroom, you can point out the importance of not jumping right to evaluate like we did with the snake picture, right? Everyone understands and evaluates the same situation differently. And knowing this is the key to successful intercultural communication. Thank you. So we have another photo for you, another sport. We're going to do the same activity again, and we're going to have the three boxes, and we want you to describe, interpret, and evaluate. And remember to only describe in the beginning. Here we go. All right. Okay. So only put your answer now in the first box. What do you see? Ooh, camel. Camel. Good. Everyone see the camel. A man. Clouds, uh-huh. Good. Remember, don't try and interpret. Desert. Tell us what you think is happening, just what you see. Blue. Good. Trees. Men in uniforms, bandanas. Lots of really good answers. How about question number two now? All right, so now we want you to interpret. What do you think is happening? Camel jumping, national game. How many camels can you jump over? Oh. I think like five or six. Yeah, I, can, I could definitely jump over six camels. <laughs> you could not. I challenge you. You challenge me to a camel duel? Mm -hmm. 
camel jump I accept camel. the challenge. Excellent. Next time that we find six camels. Next time we're in the desert with camels. Yes. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> we'll put it on the name for you. <laughs> okay, question number three. Remember, this is difficult, so do your best to guess. What cultural messages or cultural values are part of this activity? What's the cultural significance? Third box. Keeping traditions, great. Power, challenge. Become a boy to a man or right? passage. Remembering their roots. Coming together. Excellent. Endurance, that's a good answer. I see lots of rite of passage mm -hmm. kind of answers. That's really interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Great. So um, this is Yemeni camel jumping. Yemeni camel jumping. Yemeni camel jumping. So they, they, this is an activity done in Yemen. It is. And they, um, we interviewed a Yemeni man and asked him to evaluate the cultural values in this photo. So let's listen to the interview. I want to hear it. Me too. What cultural values do you think are expressed in this game? Well, this game happens in certain areas inside Yemen, and it's uh, only for one tribe, if I'm not mistaken. And these people live with camels in the desert, and the camel is like an essential element of their culture. It's men-dominated. You don't see women participating in this competition, probably because the men like jump higher and they can show their underwear and legs, which consider not okay in that culture. And how is this man treated in the village after he jumps the most camels? He gets a little bit of money from the people watching the game, but it's not really important. They do it because they like that the village or this tribe like coming together all as one person and they play their favorite game. All right, so we're going to ask the same thing again. If you would raise your hand if you saw a difference in the uh, Yemeni's evaluation and your evaluation. Mm -hmm. I raise my hand. That's great. Yeah, there is a big difference because he has the background knowledge. And something that is really interesting is that I showed the Mongolian wrestling photo to the Yemeni and when he evaluated the Mongolian photo, he actually used the same words to that he used to describe the camel jumping. He used the same values because he was applying his background knowledge to the Mongolian wrestling. Fascinating. You know what? What? Well, when I talked to the Mongolian and I did the interview, I showed her the Yemeni camel jumping photo. And? The answers that she gave were very much like the answers she gave for that is so interesting. What does that mean? I think it means what we're saying here today, that we're applying our own background knowledge and we jump to evaluating through our own background knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right? I think so. Okay, so this activity we just led you through by breaking down the three phases and separating them would be a great tool in your classroom. Um, we're going to have these photos available for you. That's right. And so you could use these photos in your classroom, or you can choose your own photos. And it doesn't have to be about sports. It could be about anything. And you could use them in small groups with your students. You could do a gallery walk. A gallery walk. What's a gallery walk, John Mark? I'm glad you asked. Are you? A gallery walk is when you put up photos in, the, in your classroom, and students walk around, and they complete an activity related to the photos. So you can have them do, describe, interpret, evaluate in groups as they go through the class. Excellent. So um, in, we have developed something for our participants today, haven't we? That's right. Well, uh, we are both English teachers. I'm an English teacher. I'm definitely an English teacher, and uh, I like to plan lessons. Um, I understand wouldn't that you're not a huge fan of lesson planning. I like it sometimes. Sometimes, that's all right. Well, Whitney and I work hard on a, a project plan that we're going to share with you, and very soon it will be available to download on the main site. But we're going to talk about it first. So basically what will happen is in this plan, students are going to work in groups. Now, I like putting students into groups. To me, four is the perfect group size. But in some places, working in groups is not as easy. 
So you can modify this for your own students, of course. But it takes several class lessons. Students are going to explore their understanding of culture, just like you did in this webinar. They're going to conduct interviews with friends and family on a cultural topic. They're going to consolidate and summarize their findings in their groups, and then report on their findings in the class presentation. Excellent. And as good teachers, we know that the first thing we want to do when we plan a project is to set our goals, uh -huh. right? So our goals in this project are to practice the four language skills for useful communicative purposes, improve skills in critical and creative thinking, mm -hmm. and explore culture in a new way that makes them better intercultural communicators. Fantastic. So I, I plan to divide it into three stages. Stage one, click, is controlled activities. Uh, in this stage, these students will form project groups and discuss their own definitions of culture, and they'll read, write, and discuss the topic, which we explored already in the webinar, universal sports themes. Excellent. And stage two is where we're going to move into semi-controlled and independent activities where the teacher can step back a little bit and let the students take over, um, where they're going to practice interviews in class with their groups and conduct interviews outside of class on their sports theme, and then they're going to discuss their interview findings in their project group when they come back to class. And finally, stage three, uh, independent activities. And this is where the teacher kind of stands back, lets them practice, give a group presentation, and then complete assessment worksheets of their peers and of their own performance. Excellent. And so this is project-based learning. Oh. Right? Why project-based learning? What do you think? Yeah, let's see what our webinar friends say. Do you all use project-based learning? And why? Group work is amazing. Right. It's fun, absolutely. Students really enjoy it. Allows them to explore. Mm -hmm. Group work. Ah, students with different abilities have opportunities to succeed. That is excellent. Uh -huh. Using their own ideas. That's critical and creative thinking, isn't it? Yeah. Hands-on experience, teamwork, interaction. These are fantastic answers. I wish I thought of these answers. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> okay, so let's look at some of the answers we came up with. So, project-based learning encourages independent learning. Mm -hmm. Even though they're working in project teams, they're also having to independently contribute to those teams and groups. So, it encourages that. Uh, it allows for creative language use. It's so difficult sometimes with traditional uh, activities to get students to use language creatively when they're just reading in a book and answering questions. But with a project, you can have them working together in different ways, reading, speaking, listening, writing, in a way that's very creative and also interesting. And interesting. Of course, as we spoke about, it allows them to engage in critical thinking activities, you know, inserting the assessment instead of just gathering information. They're going to assess the information they're gathering. Mm -hmm. And you can tailor it to your students' needs and interests. This is really important because every group of students, in fact, every individual student, has his or her own needs and goals in learning English. And the materials that we're going to provide you on the main site will be modifiable, and we encourage you to do so. It also op offers teachers the opportunity to provide holistic and Subjective feedback, where in the project scheme, in the controlled, semi-controlled, and then independent activity, you can provide feedback throughout all of those stages, which is very holistic and helps you understand your students and the students understand themselves. Absolutely. All right. So stage one, in this stage, learners are going to explore their own definition of culture. This is a lot of fun. Learn about American culture as it's expressed through baseball. Now, this isn't necessarily a project about baseball. However, it will be very useful to use baseball and the materials that we have as an example before they begin exploring their own sport. They'll explore universal sports themes like we talked about earlier. 
They're going to select and explore a sport that has local cultural value, just like baseball has local cultural value to Americans. Great. So, in order to get your students' brains warmed up and activated for sports, one of the first activities that you're going to do in your classroom is a sports brainstorm. Okay. So, we want to do that with you right now. So, brainstorm. What sports do you all know? Yeah, name as many sports as you can. Try and name some sports that maybe are local and not very well known. Fencing. Oh, I know. Wow. Football, camel racing, excellent. Yeah. After you jump over, then you race them. <laughs> American football. Hello. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, Bahrain is a little island, so they got mm -hmm. These are great. Ballroom Hurdles? dancing. I hadn't thought about that. Ballroom dancing. Dog sledding. <laughs> That's great. Cricket? Uh-huh. I like cricket. Yes. Cricket's a lot like baseball. It is. Yeah. Except not. Well, it's different, yeah. Because I can play baseball, but I cannot cricket play cricket. Cricket is hard. Cricket is really hard. It's different. Yeah. Biking, handball, so wow, this is a lot. This is great. So this is how you're going to activate your students, by doing the same thing. Get them to start thinking about their local sports and the sports they know about. Now let's talk about cultural values. And it's important when we talk about values, so think about in this uh, project, we want to draw a connection between a cultural value and the universal sports theme because that's what the students are going to do. So first, work ethic. Hmm, every culture has a different work ethic. I think you know, everybody works hard. We define work ethic very differently, don't we? Definitely. Yeah. Every culture. Social change. Hmm. I know that Americans tend to value rapid social change, but maybe um, some people prefer a little bit more slow change. What do you think? Definitely cultures that I've worked in have um, not been as receptive to quick social change as I'm used to in America. Equality. People define equality and egalitarianism very, very differently depending on where they're from. Very different. This is a big one. Yeah. Directness and honesty. Sometimes as an American, I've definitely gotten myself in trouble with being maybe too direct. Me too. Privacy. Wow, what does it mean to be alone? What does the word even mean? Just like uh, trying to figure out why people smile. Everybody defines this word differently. Materialism. Uh, do you think, Whitney, that the Americans are accused of being overly materialistic? We are definitely accused of that, and not that it's a bad thing, but as I've traveled, I've seen that we are slightly more materialistic than many other countries. Oh, collectivism versus individualism. So do we work together, or do we work independently? Which do we value more? Yeah. I think in baseball, even though you're on a team, as we said before, your individual effort is what's most important. Yeah, that's how they collect the statistics. Exactly. Level of formality. Hmm. Do you think Americans are more formal or more informal, usually? I would say Americans are more informal. Yeah, I think so too. But and, and being a spectator at a baseball game is very informal. Very informal. Sports where it is formal, like um, golf, yes. tennis. Yeah, yeah. You have to be really quiet. You have to dress nicely. You have to dress nicely. The trend. Optimism, view of the future. Uh, yes. Well, what is the future? Right? I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we all know what the future is. But the I think future. Americans think. I think that Americans tend to be seen as being overly optimistic about the future, right? Uh. And uh, I, I know some baseball teams that have no chance to go to the playoffs, but they're still optimistic about making it. <laughs> Definitely. And competition versus cooperation? I uh, think Americans what were you going to say about that one? Well, I think Americans are pretty competitive. We are very competitive. Oh. Definition of time is a good one. What, do you, what is time? Time is very, very, very important. Yeah? Yes. You uh, have to be on schedule. You right. have to make appointments. Right. You have to schedule your week a week in advance. Mm -hmm. These are all very, very important things. To everyone, right? I think, well, to Americans, definitely. 
Yeah. To everyone in the whole world. Oh, uh, well, in different ways. do you think? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I've been to countries where the definition of time is very different from my own. Absolutely. All right. So, oh. cultural values are oh. one of the most difficult thing to get your students to grasp. So, after teaching them the values, it's good to get them to have some fun and play a game. Um, this game that we're going to show you is using the uh, cultural values. And you can also, instead of doing it in a quiz type way, you could also do it in um, a bingo, mm -hmm. which um, the latest uh, issue on issue, um, forum is, has a bingo instruction. Yes. And we're going to put the link to it here. There's a great article written by moderator Heather, actually, where she outlines great ways to use bingo in your classroom. But we can't really play bingo on a webinar, so we turned it into a quiz-style game show, Excellent. which is also just as fun. I think so. All right. Can I play? Yes. All right. So, John Mark. Yes, Whitney. This American value is seen in baseball when we emphasize a player's own achievements. Hmm. So my choices are individualism, social change, or privacy. Let's see what the participants say before I answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with our participants and say the answer is A, individualism. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, that yeah. is correct. Where did I win? You won the next question. Right. Okay. This American value is seen in baseball because games can't end in a tie. Games can't end in a tie? What is a tie? A tie is when the game is over and each team has the same score. Oh, no, no, no. Baseball has to be a winner and a loser. Wendy, are you telling me that in theory a baseball game could last forever? Yes, it could actually last for forever. Yeah, well, I've been to some games where I felt like they did last forever. Which it could be a fun thing. I like the park. <laughs> but my, my back started to hurt after a while. <laughs> That's true. Right. Uh, so I'm going to hmm, I'm going to agree with the webinar friends again as well and say the answer is B, competition. Final answer? Yes. Ding, 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 ding. That is correct. Would you like to know what you've won? Yes, please. You have won the next question. Oh, hooray. This American value is seen in baseball when we focus on the importance of practice and finding success. Practice and finding success. The options are work ethic, honesty, and individualism. Practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. That word is in our webinar a lot, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm going to say the answer is A, a work ethic. Ding, 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 ding. That is correct. Now, what did I really win? What you have won is an electronic version of Forum, which can be found at AmericanEnglish.state.gov. AmericanEnglish.state.gov? Yes. I'm going to go there as soon as the webinar is over and download Forum. Excellent. So, because the cultural values are a little bit more difficult for your students to grasp, again, it's really great to give them something fun so that they can play with the cultural values to develop their understanding of them. All right, so moving on in our project plan stage two, students will oops, uh, practice and conduct short interviews outside of class. They will develop their own interview skills and strategies, which is difficult. Interviews are difficult. Uh, they're going to ask friends and family to share their own thoughts in the interviews on cultural values that are in the local sport. And they're going to work in their project groups to summarize their findings and look for common threads because each group is going to have several different interviews to read and they look for similarities or differences in what people said. Excellent. Yeah. So they're going to do interviews. Uh-huh. And we mentioned that interviews are difficult. Interviews are very difficult. Mm -hmm. So what are some qualities of an effective interview? That's a good question. I also think that this question is culturally loaded, isn't it? It is. People from different parts of the world might define an effective interview differently. They definitely will. I wonder what our webinar friends say. What are some qualities of an effective interview? I'll close, close and open questions. 
asking the right questions. The right questions. This is why you practice. Honest reporting. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yes, yes. Confidence. Uh -huh. Giving feedback. No ambiguous questions. That's good. Very good. All right, so let's look at some of the ones we've outlined that are in addition to our webinar friends' ideas. Attitude. <laughs> Be friendly and patient. Uh huh. That is always very important. That's right. They should ask follow up questions. What's a follow up question? So, you know, you'll give your students a main question to ask, and then a follow up question is after you receive the interviewee's response you think of a thoughtful question that would get more information from them. Interesting. Good follow-up questions are right. super important. That's right. Why would you say that they're important? See, that was a follow-up question. That was a great follow-up <laughs> question, John Mark. I'm not going to answer your follow-up question. That's right. It was, it was a rhetorical follow-up question. Excellent. <laughs> Those are the best. So, you also need to take good notes. And make sure your interviewee understands what is expected of them. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Let's move on to stage three. Uh-huh. This is the exciting stage where students get to work independently. So they're going to plan and practice their group presentations. They're going to give presentations to the class. And then finally, they're going to complete worksheets where they assess their peers' performance and then there's themselves. And of course, they'll also receive a grade from the teacher. In the materials that you will be able to give at the main site, you will have copies of all of the grading rubrics that you can use and modify as you wish. And then finally, at the very end, they're going to revisit their original definitions of culture to see maybe how they've changed during the project. That is so interesting. So in this, in this, Next part, we're going, you said in stage three, they're going to do presentations, which can be very difficult. Yes, giving presentations is hard. So and giving webinars is hard, too. Webinars are very <laughs> fun. Fun, yes. So are presentations. That's right. So what makes a good presentation? And this is also culturally relevant, too, because a presentation can be done and defined differently depending on who you are and where you're from. Definitely. Every culture has a different concept of public speaking and presentation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you should take into account in your country. Yeah, but we have maybe some, well, we'd like to get some answers from our webinar friends, right? Yeah. What makes a good presentation? Practice, preparedness. Knowledge, vocabulary, informative, condensed, true and clear information. Coherence is very important. This is great. Pronunciation, ah, get good sleep the night before. That's a very good idea, isn't it? It's a great idea. Eye contact. I'm oh, using images. Make it interesting. Yeah, making it interesting and using images is great. Don't keep your hands in your pocket. That's my, you know, I never know what to do with my hands. Yeah, that's the worst when someone has their hands in their pocket. Right, yeah. I probably do it, and I don't realize it. These are all great. Let's look at some of ours. Practice. That was one of the first ones our webinar friend said. Organize clearly and concise. And to, in order to be concise, they really need to be organized. So those two go hand in hand. And personalize. It's always important to share personal stories in a presentation. You don't want to feel like someone is reading you a book. So there's also the physical part of a presentation, which someone mentioned not putting their hands in their pocket, like gestures. Tone and projection, you need to speak loudly and clearly. Make eye contact. You don't want to go to a presentation where the person is looking down the whole time. Wait, should I, should I look at one person the whole time, or should, should I do it differently? Oh, no, you should shift your eye contact for around to each person in the room. Ooh, interesting. And a smile. That's right. Always smile. Smile just like the people in the, well, like maybe like the first lady in the picture. Exactly. Right. So this is our project plan. Um, let's look at what we've done in our webinar today. Well, Whitney, first we looked at traditional concepts of culture together with our webinar friends. We did. And then we discussed the importance of understanding the depth of culture. Mm -hmm. 
Remember the iceberg, the optical illusion? Yes. The fish? Remember the fish? Uh, we raised our awareness of lack of background knowledge. We examined universal sports themes and cultural values and how they are connected. We practiced uh, engaging in the three phases of describe interpretive value, which I found thrilling. Thrilling. And it's also the fact that it's really important to break them up into three distinct phases mm -hmm. and lead our students through the process. And we explored our project that you can implement with your students to teach them usable and relevant cultural skills. Wow. So cool. now let's do the same thing that our students are going to do in this project. We would like for you to answer this question again. Uh huh. So we want our webinar friends to answer the questions, maybe see how their answer has changed. Yeah. Remember when we asked this question at the beginning? Has your uh, understanding changed? And if so, how? And this is exactly how you're going to end your project with your students. You're going to ask them how their understanding of culture has changed. And we hope that your understanding has changed and that our webinar has helped you. Values and beliefs, customs. I think, I think they were listening to me. Do you think that this, um, you know, in the beginning of the webinar, we asked you how often you integrate culture into your class. Do you think this webinar is going to allow you to begin to integrate it more? I think so. Especially when they can download the materials. Definitely. And I think that something John Mark and I would love for you to walk away from this webinar with is that using your local culture in your English classroom is just as important as integrating American culture and it's almost critical for helping your students to understand the depth of American culture by looking at their own. That's right. Treating them like fish. Exactly. And what do we want them to become eventually? Successful intercultural communicators. communicators. That's the whole idea, right? That is the whole idea. So thank you so much for being with us today. That's right. I, I can't believe our webinar is over. Does anyone have questions for us? Any questions? Yeah, we have a few minutes. A lot of thank you. Oh, you're, welcome. You're, you're, welcome. you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You can say it one time. It's enough, I think. Oh. Yes. You're welcome, Claudia. You're welcome, Chris. <laughs> You're welcome, Alicia. Uh -huh. No question. Uh, here we go. How can you use this with young learners? I think you can answer that question. I can learners. answer that question. This project is great with young learners because you would choose the images and the themes according to something that is relevant to them. So you might um, just try to get them to look into uniforms, for example, mm -hmm. something that young learners could identify with more and take them through the process. That's the great thing about Describe, Interpret, Evaluate is that it's relevant to all ages of learners mm -hmm. because it's very um, broken down to describe, interpret, and evaluate, and you can lead them through that process quite easily. That's right, and I don't think with young learners it's very important to talk about cultural lives like we did in the webinar, just getting them to do the activities is enough, I think, right? Definitely. Get them to start being aware of something else, not just the vocabulary. Great. Any other questions? Do with shy students. Oh, that's really good. Well, what I have done in the classroom, because, you know, all students are different, and I can identify with students that are a little bit shy. I make sure that, for example, when they're working in their groups, that maybe the shyer student who isn't as ready to talk right away gets some kind of task that he or she can do. And uh, I think also that when they're giving a presentation, you can maybe make an arrangement with the student who is shy about presenting. Maybe this student can do some of the extra preparation work and then only speak very briefly during the presentation. I think there are a lot of opportunities for allowing students that 
maybe aren't as outgoing as others to fully contribute? Definitely. All right, so these are some great questions. We would love to see you all posting these questions in the meeting and, um, and like weighing in and sharing best practices across the world. I think we have one more question, or a couple questions. Any rubrics available for project evaluation? Oh, are there rubrics? <laughs> How many do we have? I think four? No, three? we have three rubrics uh -huh. for you. Um, three for the students to see what's expected of them, and then we have an actual grading rubric for you to use to assess the students and make your comments. Mm -hmm. Great. And regarding the, uh, the photograph of the child with the snake, I actually got it from a teacher, a friend of mine, so I don't know where he found it. Did he take it in his home? I Possibly, possibly, but probably not. Can we use some movie parts to talk about some specific cultural themes? Absolutely. Using video in class is great. My only advice would be choose very carefully, and I wouldn't use longer than 30 seconds to a minute at a time. You can get a lot of information in a very short clip. That's great. So thank you all for your questions and again we would love to see these questions in the meeting and you guys can talk about using young learners and shy students all right that's it right john mark unfortunately i think that's all that is all so we would love to say happy webinar wednesday happy webinar wednesday